But we were, in, we were in town, the Democratic Party's in town. This is not a Democratic Party event, but I just really feel that whenever we get together, we gotta talk about health care because the Senate is contemplating a health care bill right now, uh, which I suspect um, is going to be uh, as harsh as the House version. Not so, so, but, but nobody really knows exactly what the contours are gonna be because they've been very hush-hush. But they can bring it in, and they can put it, and they can skip the committee process and get it in front of the uh, uh, the body. Um, they'll probably only need about 51 votes to pass it, and uh, and and they could, uh, if they structure it right, they can avoid a conference committee. And the only question is, what is you know, um, what are what is the community going to do about it? Are we going to say that we're going to see? you know, literally 23 million people lose health care access and see prices go up. Um, so my brother's going to come in and do a welcome in a minute, but I just want to say thanks for coming out on a nice day like this. And we'll just talk a little bit about health care. And then, but my ask to you is Facebook it, tweet it, get the word out. And so now I'm just going to ask my brother Brian Ellison, my Reverend Ellison, to come say just a welcome on behalf of the congregation. And he has a church picnic to get to, and then we'll get started. Here. So give my brother a hand as he comes on up. Well, I'm Congressman's big brother. But he teaches me so much. I just read this book. And um, let me tell you about my church really quick. We're very, uh, we're activist church, and can you hear me? Yeah, we're activist church. Every uh, year we do things with uh, domestic violence, uh, keeping safe, and it's a it's a big deal, okay. And so if you're interested, just get in touch with me, okay. And uh, we're gonna have it in October, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Also, we we. Uh, Feed the hungry, we hit the streets and actually go to the people who are homeless. And we give them toiletries and we give them food. We do it on a regular basis. Our next big event, we're taking our church to Washington, D.C. to go to the African American Museum. And thanks to my brother, uh, he, they, they treat us like royalty every time we go. So I appreciate that. So uh, somebody said to me, I don't mind being used. I just don't want to be misused. So that's how I, I see my brother. He is, he's up here, he's an international figure, and so I try to ride, ride his coattails. But I want to thank you for being here. Our services are at 11 o'clock on Sunday. Um, theologically, I wrote a pamphlet. It's in the windowsill, grab it, read it for yourself. We are, we are I'm not gonna say we're liberal. I will say we're ultra progressive, okay? <laughs> Can I say it like that? Okay. We are, we take theology seriously. And we believe that theology is a liberating force. And uh, we treat our LGBT members just like everybody else. We're mean to them. But, <laughs> no, I'm teasing about that. We treat everybody with love. Uh, we take the scriptures very seriously. And we believe that to read them in a fundamentalist way is to misread them. And uh, we treat everybody the same. And, uh, we're having a picnic right now, and they want me there, but I want to be here and there, okay? But come on, I'm trying to build a congregation of progressive-minded people, progressive-minded people. And uh, I am a lover of liberation theology, and it floats my boat. And uh, we have lady preachers, lady deacons, everything. It's, it's a progressive church. And this is the kind of church I hope to pastor when I started preaching at the age of 19. So now here's just one little fun, two funny things. I don't think he thinks it's funny, he, but my brother is going to be having a birthday August 4th, August 4th. He's born the same day as Barack Obama. I don't know what that means, but you know. 
for the month of August we're the same age. My birthday's August 29th. I was born the same day as John McCain. <laughs> I, the parents didn't coordinate that. Okay? It just happened that way. But I want you to have a good time. He is responsible for anything that happens in this building. We have the police here to help us. And uh, feel free to restrooms downstairs, uh, water downstairs. The air is on, okay? But I will see you in about one hour. Okay? Yes. We're going the um, 7th, 8th, 9th, and coming back the 10th of uh, August. We got a bus. Yes. Oh, we're going to have a good time, though. We, we are traveling, church. We've been to Gettysburg. We've been to Washington about five or six times, Jamestown, Williamsburg. Uh, all throughout Massachusetts, we're traveling, church. So, okay. I'm out. Hey, let's hear it from Rev. Dallas. So I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, what I'd like to do is engage in a conversation, a back and forth dialogue about health care in our country. Uh, the place to start, I think, is to the period before we pass the Affordable Care Act. Before we pass the Affordable Care Act, you had, uh, you, if, when you looked at bankruptcy filings, uh, upwards of 57% of them were uh, due to medical debt. Before the Affordable Care Act, we had 47 million people who were uninsured. Before the Affordable Care Act, you had galloping medical inflation rates. Uh, before the Affordable Care Act, I can tell you as a person who knocks doors and talks to uh, people a lot, that we would see, folks would always pull me aside and tell me about their health care nightmares. I can't tell you how many people I've met who have told me just horrendous things about healthcare access, including a woman last week who said to me, look, I'm 34 years old, my mother had died of breast cancer, her sister died of breast cancer. If the Affordable Care Act gets taken away, that's gonna mean I'm gonna have a pre-existing condition if I have breast cancer. And I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm worried and I'm thinking about having a double mastectomy so that because I can't afford to die because I got little kids at home. So this, these are the kind of decisions that people are being forced to make. We hear these decisions all the time. When we entered the debate in uh, 2009 about health care reform, I'm, I want to tell you that I was one who believed that we should have Medicare for all. I believe in a single-payer health care system. There are several single-payer health care systems we have in place now. We have single-payer health care uh, in the VA. Uh, we have single-payer health care in Medicare. Uh, and, and they're not always the same, and they can be adjusted. But it's not something that we don't see around our country quite a bit. Uh, we had 170 different hearings on uh, health care reform when, as we walked up to passage of the Affordable Care Act. We had uh, amendments by Republicans and Democrats uh, we had a uh, real an engaged process. And in August uh, 2010, uh, we went into our August recess without passing health care, uh, the Affordable Care Act. And let me tell you, uh, people came to my community meetings and were pretty upset and were very, very clear about how they felt. I had to answer questions about death penalty. I had to answer questions about a lot of things that uh, you know, really, so many were myths, but sometimes people just didn't know. Uh, and so we had these meetings, they were, they were caustic, they were you know, sometimes difficult, but we had them, because that's democracy. Uh, right now, as we're looking at the American Health Care Act, which is a Republican bill, uh, some people call it Trump Care, uh, there has not been this process. In fact, when the House bill was introduced, we didn't have any hearings at all. They tolerated no amendments. Uh, and uh, the bill, uh, the, the American Health Care Act, is a piece of legislation that would dramatically reduce Medicare access and uh, Medicare, uh, Medicaid, excuse me, Medicaid. And because of the Medicaid reductions, uh, now they, there will be a lot more money available uh, for tax funds. And it will alleviate tax, funds, uh, tax burden for uh, people who have had assessments in order to pay for the act. It will also uh, allow 
uh, insurance companies to pay uh, to, to, to charge people five times more if they're 50 years old uh, and un but, but less than 65 years old. And uh, this is without regard to your health insurance. I'm 53 years old. I can run five miles. I can bench press 200 pounds. I got low blood pressure, but I'd have to pay five times more than somebody, you know, 30 years old. Uh, other th features of the act. If you, now, under the Affordable Care Act, you know, we had the individual mandate and saying that everybody has to get health care. You have to, you know, uh, if you don't get it, there'll be like a $95 assessment in the first year, and so on and so forth. What the Republican bill, the Trump care bill does in the House version, it says that you don't have an individual mandate, but if you're not covered, if you have a gap in coverage, they can charge you exorbitant rates to get reinsured, to get insured again. So, and the money does not go to the government to defray the cost of health care, it just goes to the insurance company. Under the Affordable Care Act, we said that um, gender and sex discrimination is illegal. You cannot charge women more for health care. And you all know that before the Affordable Care, uh, care Act, women paid more for health care. Uh, and women paid more, and, and in fact, they, the, the uh, insurance industry treated being female as if it were a pre-existing condition. And, uh, now under, and, and of course, under the Affordable Care Act, we said you could not uh, lock people out because they had a pre-existing condition. You couldn't uh, charge them exorbitant rates. It had to be affordable. In the new version, in the uh, uh, American Health Care Act, Trump Care, uh, they say, okay, we will protect pre-existing conditions, but we're going to take the essential benefits package, which I'll explain in a moment, and we're going to give it to the states. And the states will be able to decide which essential benefits will be covered. Now, for those of you who don't know what I mean by essential benefits, what it means is that, look, in the past you used to be able to buy a health care policy, but, you know, it only was in effect if you got injured or sick on Tuesday, 4 o'clock, you know, in the thunderstorm. Now, I'm joking, but what I really mean is there was a lot of exclusions, a lot of limitations. It didn't cover everyone. So you could buy a policy, but the deductible might be $10,000. It might be, uh, it might exclude a lot of things that, that people do need. And so you had insurance, but it really wasn't any good, which is why, going back to my original point, health care uh, was something that, um, that a lot of people went, bank went into bankruptcy uh, for because even though, they, even though they had insurance, the deductible and the, and the limits on the annual and lifetime limits would uh, just make people not be able to afford it. Under the American uh, Health Care Act, the, the Trump Care Bill, uh, the, 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 uh, this essential benefits package, which says you must cover these things in order to be a legitimate uh, policy, what they say is that the state will be able to decide what is in the essential benefits package. And several states have already said, if it passes, we're going to exclude um, uh, uh, certain um, pregnancy. We're going to exclude mental health. We're going to exclude a lot of things that are really, really necessary for people's good health. So, uh, and uh, they can exclude pre-existing condition because one of the essential health benefits is that you treat people with pre-existing conditions uh, uh, with, uh, with, with, with respect and with equality. So you can literally get rid of the pre-existing condition problems. So where we are now with, uh, with the situation is that the Senate is now, uh, is that the House passed a version. They couldn't get enough people to pass it. They, and, and they uh, and so they and, and so they uh, they backed up and went back to work. I'm speaking of the House version now, because the Congressional Budget Office found that if they were to pass this bill and it made law, 24 million people would lose health care. So then the Republicans went back to the Congressional uh, to the Drawing Board and passed another version, and well, 23 million people would lose health care under the revised House bill. And uh, that's according to the Congressional Budget Office. So no matter how you slice it, literally millions of Americans will not have health care access that they have right now. And millions more 
will pay millions more. And so this leads me to the Senate. So the reason that we call this meeting, and we only gave you guys a few days notice to come here, because uh, we didn't have, I felt that it was urgent to talk to Detroiters about the imminent action by the U.S. Senate uh, under the leadership of Mitch McConnell. We expect they're going to pass some version of health care very soon. But they've been very hush-hush about it. They're hoping we're not paying attention because they're hoping in all of the Trump stuff, all the Comey stuff, all of the other stuff. Uh, you know, I got some friends of mine who might want to join me up front if you guys can. Uh, Christine, Rahma, if you guys can join me up here. Ken, uh, yeah, if you guys can come on up. Uh, I got some friends of mine, they're very active in politics and they would like to hear your views uh, on, on this issue. But as I was talking, talking about the, the uh, Senate bill, under the Senate bill, uh, we don't really know what's going to be contained in that. We do know that in order for it to pass, uh, it's going to have to uh, cut services and dramatically increase uh, the chance for help for our tax cut for the wealthies. It's going to have to, it's going to be much more what they would call a free market product. They'll give much more power back to the insurance companies, much more say so back to the insurance companies, and a lot less regulation. Now, the Republicans have turned regulation into a bad word. What it really means is the government making people abide by health and safety rules, making sure the products are fair, making sure the products are affordable. And so we don't know exactly what the Senate bill is going to look like, but it can be released really within any, any day. In fact, many of us are expecting that it will be released before uh, the, the Congress goes on August recess. So we're quite concerned about it. We don't want to allow them to drop a bill on our head and then move it by, move it through very quickly. So I just want to say uh, we've been joined by Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. She agrees with me that we have got to talk to as many Americans as we can about this imminent Senate bill. Even though you have two senators who believe in health care access, it's still important to let your voices be heard. Even though you believe uh, you have a, a number of, uh, you have John Conyers and Brendan Lawrence and, and many others in this room who believe in health care access, this is the time to write letters, to write postcards, to say, you know, that you like your health, that you like the health care as it is, if you do. And let me just tell you, going back to the days when the only health care access anyone had was the ER is not a good idea. Going back to the days when you go and you go to the most expensive care, because you know by the time you get to the ER, you've gotten even more sick by then, right? You delayed whatever it was that was ailing you, and you just got to an emergency. Whereas if you had a clinic to go to, they could get in there quicker. They could help you with your problem earlier, and uh, it would be the kind of thing uh, that a sane, healthy society would do. But with that, I want to tell you that we have a we have a speak out mic right here, and if you are willing, I'd like you to just come up and share your views about healthcare. Uh, I'd like you to limit your views to about a minute, but you can get back in line if you like, and you don't have to. But what I don't want to what I want to do is avoid that. You ever been to a meeting where somebody talks for 30 minutes? Other people don't get a chance. You know, but, but you know, some folks got a lot to say, amen, right? But we do want as many people to be heard from as we can get. And so what I'd like to do is let you all know that we're, the way we're going to proceed is we're going to let uh, Congresswoman Lawrence uh, have some, offer her comments on health care access. And then, uh, I'd like to introduce a few friends of mine who are here from out of town who uh, are very interested in your views uh, and, and, and they'll introduce themselves and then it'll be your turn to share your opinion and let me tell you, you don't have to know all about health care to have offer your opinion. You can just tell us what you went through, what your life was like, how much your medication costs, you know, what kind of struggles that you're dealing with in terms of making sure that America has good health care. Uh, and just remind you all that America is the richest country in the world 
It's the richest country in the history of the world, and it's at its richest point in its own history right now. Meaning, per capita domestic product, per capita you know, income for America is as high now as it ever has been in the history of the country. And if countries like Canada and Germany and England to make sure that people get health care, I think that we can too, if we have the will. But it's going to be you all who stand up and let your voices be heard and demand that. So uh, let's uh, uh, give a big hearty hand to our Congresswoman, Brenda Lawrence. Those of you who are not of the black church persuasion, welcome to our world. Uh, the word moves you, but the heat may take you over. Uh, I just want to say a couple things about health care. You know, this is a conversation that we need to have, and if you're not a Democrat, I want you to know that I am fiercely committed to being a Democrat. So there's a lot of independent people that are where conversations, what is the party doing for you? So, one of the things that the Democratic Party constantly measure ourselves, are we being compassionate? And are we helping those who don't have a voice? Are we being a voice Are we helping people who are no less than us, but their economics may give them challenges in life? So, ladies and gentlemen, this is where it is. So, what they're looking, when they look at health care, they look at a business, and they look at profit margins, and they say, how can we have a health care system that we can make money from? The Democrats come back and say, wait a minute. If you do that, you're going to eliminate people who don't have the resources to engage in a profit-making endeavor. Let me give you an example. If you, any of you in here, and I'm not asking for raise your hands, but if any of you in here have asthma, diabetes, have heart disease, you have hypertension, this is just four things. You are now a high risk. And they're going to put you in a pool, and you're going to pay extra for health care. Now some of you are going like, it's not fair, I shouldn't have to pay more money. There's others who are going to say, I don't have money. And we're going to go back to the system that Keith talked about, that when I have an asthma attack, I'm going to run to emergency to get treatment. If my hypertension or my diabetes get out of control, then I'll have, I'll be in a diabetic coma or I'll have uh, a heart attack or something as a result of not managing a chronic disease like that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is about your quality of life. And what is, you, you all know the story, there are people who voted for Donald Trump who said, I hate Obamacare, but keep that affordable health care stuff, I like that. <laughs> we have a responsibility, I feel. And I say this all the time, politics without compassion is criminal. It would be criminal to have those who do not have the financial resources and we have developed a system in America for health care to take care of people because if you take care of people in the, in the front, then you don't have this chronic high cost in the end to remediate all of those effects of unmanaged health care. Now, something that women in this room, I want you to be real clear about. If you go to a company and you're pregnant, you're a pre-existing condition. If you go to a company and they look at you, they can say, oh, wait a minute, you know, there's issues here. Think about the woman who has a child that has something as uh, common as a child with asthma. This is another issue we need to talk about. Any of you who've ever raised a child who 
has a health challenge, how often do you have to take off work? How often yeah. do you have to leave to take care of your child? Some of you are taking care of your seniors, elder care. How many of you are dealing with that now? Your daycare provider is not showing up or your parent in the middle of the day have something or overnight and you're up all night. We have just part of living. You're not doing anything criminal. You didn't make it up. You would never want these diseases. But where's our compassion in America? Yep. So I want you to know, as we work, and you hear what Keith is saying, the Democratic Party, why, someone said, why should I support the Democrats? Be, be, be woke and be engaged and be able to speak to it. Some of you are getting health care now who have never gotten it before. Our young people, they're, they're saying they're going to keep the, the ability to keep our young people on health care until they get a job. Thank goodness, I guess even the rich have kids, so they, they understood that. But let's stay woke, stay engaged. I don't want to keep you much longer because uh, some of you are start melting. And so I want you to know that we have, we have, a, we have a job. Congress. And I don't know if Keith talks about that. I just want to say this, this quietly, Keith, before I leave. What happened this week with the shooting? And one of my colleagues designed it, described it well. It was as if someone took a vacuum cleaner and sucked the air out of the wall. You went, <gasps> and some of us are still trying to exhale. We're still trying to figure out how someone could elevate to the level of violence like that as a result of their opinion of political views. I want you all to know something, that we in this great country of America, this is a democracy. This is a country that's built on a two-party system. We have always had disagreements, but unfortunately, it has risen to a level beyond the issue and it's attacking the person. And I, you know, they won't say it, but our president led a mantra for a year and a half. Kick him out, sock him in the face, crooked Hillary, lock her up, calling names, encouraging and nurturing anger. I want you all to be motivated, encouraged, and, and just passionate about voting and about our issues. But I don't support violence on any end. And we have enough demonstration. Unfortunately, the current president of the United States is a gift that keeps giving. We all know where he stands and his, his, his inefficiencies and how uh, inappropriate he is to be the president of the United States. So why don't we focus on what we're going to bring to the table when we take back the House in 2018? going to look different when Democrats get the power to bring compassion and leadership back to this country. So I'm asking you, keep that energy, keep that passion, stay, stay focused, stay woke. But I'm not encouraging anyone to, to use violence. It is unacceptable. And the last thing I'm going to say, when are we going to get to the point where we can have a reasonable discussion about gun violence in America? Thank you all. So I just want to say, you know, look, if no matter what party you are in, you're welcome to be here. We're, this is an open forum. Um, and we do have an open mic. We'd like to encourage you to join. Share your story. Ask your question. We want you to, uh, to be part of this dialogue. It is so critical. Uh, but before we go to that part of the program, we have some out-of-town friends uh, who I just would like to uh, give a chance to introduce themselves because they've come literally all over the country to be here today. So, uh, you want to go to Hawaii? <laughs> Aloha, my name is Tim Vanderveer, and I come from the great state of Hawaii, and I bring uh, great greetings to each and every one of you. I was just on the phone outside with our former governor, Neil Abercrombie, uh, who was actually a friend of uh, Barack Obama's mom and dad when they were all at the University of Hawaii together. Uh, but he sends his greetings to you as well. I'm the chair of the Democratic Party out there. 
And uh, I, I really want to commend Representative Ellison, uh, President Ken Martin, all the folks, the hard work that they've done at the Democratic National Committee uh, for truly engaging uh, all 57 states and territories and bringing the resistance summer across this nation. We're fired up and we're ready to go, and I thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. Hi, this is Shiko Man. I came from Georgia, and I want you to pray for us. Tuesday, the whole nation is looking at Georgia 6, that you know, and if we can win that district, that is going to have an effect 2018 and beyond. So uh, just pray for us. I'm from San Francisco. My mom, Nancy Pelosi, works with Congressman Ellison and Congresswoman Lawrence in Washington, D.C. And uh, I'm also serving uh, with these fine colleagues on the Democratic National Committee. I do a lot of work with health care, and I'll tell you why. Uh, two reasons. One, since I was a little kid, we were out at single-payer marches, believing that health care is a right and not a privilege. But second, when I was pregnant with my eight-year-old child, I had ongoing fights with the insurance company about whether she was a pre-existing condition, whether her, her conditions were pre-existing conditions, and so on and so forth. I mean, she was teething by the time we saw the fights over her prenatal care. And I introduced her to President Obama when she was six months old. And I said, Mr. President, we've got to get something done. I'm a lawyer. I can fight these fights. But what about everyone else who doesn't have the training to fight an insurance company? He said, we'll get it done. And we got it done. And now we have to keep it. And I think today it's important that we hear specifically from you why it is that you fight, why it is you want us to fight. And remember that underlying all of what Trump is trying to do is this envy of Barack Obama and this racism about Barack Obama. He didn't have a plan for health care. He just wanted to make sure he repealed it on the anniversary of when it got signed. Right? And they weren't sure. Now this week he says, you know, that plan's kind of mean. Well, it is really mean. It is really mean to take away people's health care, to throw them off health care. But we know that if you tell us personally what's going on with you and we bring those voices uh, to light, we bring your stories to light to a higher level, um, like our friends at the Fight for 15 do with the Fight for Wages and Wage Justice, we know that we can fight this mean bill and put ourselves more on a path for Medicare for all. So thank you all very much. Five for 15 in the house? Yeah. So, uh, let me just tell everybody, this is a public event. It's not a party event. It's not the Democratic Party event. It's just us neighbors getting together, and I want to thank the groups that helped pull the meeting together. Yeah. Well, you want to say hello to anybody? Just a little no. quick welcome. I, I just want to, uh, we need to give it up for Congressman Ellison. He's one of the few people that's actually trying to make sure that we live our values every day, pulling folks together all around this country, and not just Democrats. This isn't, when, when, when Keith talks about democratic values, he knows that our values are Americans' values, American values, that we're not just here to fight for Democrats, we're here to fight for everyone. And, you know, there's a great Minnesota named Hubert Humphrey, who some of you might have heard. Hubert Humphrey once said that the moral test of government is how government treats those in the dawn of life, our children, those in the twilight of life, our seniors, and those in the shadows of life, the sick and the handicapped. And what type of statement are we sending when we, Republicans in Washington right now, are proposing a bill that will kick 24 million Americans off of health insurance? and essentially squeeze those with pre-existing conditions completely out of health care access. And I, I don't want to put words in Keith's mouth, but I, I know for me personally, we need to get to a place in our country once and for all where we get the profit motive out of the health insurance and out of health care. No one in this country should be making money off of the backs of sick people off the backs of the handicapped, off the backs of people who need the help the most. What type of society are we living in when there are people making millions and billions of dollars off of sick people? 
We, I personally want to see us get to a place where we have single-payer health care, where no one ever has to worry about health care access in this country again. But it's all related, whether it's the fight for 15, whether it's the fight for earned and paid sick leave, whether it's the fight for single-payer health care, it's all related. What it comes down to is making sure that we all do better when we all do better, as Paul Wellstone used to say. Right, Keith? Yes, right. So I, I couldn't be more proud to be here with uh, Congressman Nelson. And thank you for listening. Right. Well, we want to hear. So this microphone, if you want to, you can come right up and share your story. Would anybody like to come on up and talk talk a little health care today? You know. Come on up. You know, I actually got notes. I'm taking notes on what you tell me. Uh, and we want to know, and people from uh, Congressman Lawrence's office are here, we want to hear your story. So, you got the microphone, it's up, you got it. Here we go.
politically viable. We didn't think Trump was politically viable. And I have to say, on the more positive side, Bernie took, I'm sorry to relitigate the election, but Bernie took Michigan. Nobody saw that coming. So yes, it is possible for us to get it. This is the time yes. when health care is in uh, the whole country. It's a crisis. Uh, so please, y'all, please, if you have that influence, step back. We're the only developed nation in the whole world. You go right across the bridge to Canada. That's right. Everybody is covered. We need to get everybody covered. No question. No more emergency room That's care. Right. Yes. Just straight up single payer. Thank you. Don't be shy. Just don't show your story, please. Hello, everybody. My Hello. name is Monica Williams, and I'm with the 15. I'm just telling you my story as far as home health care. I have cancer. I have a stent in my heart. I also had a heart attack a month and a half ago. And my insurance company told me I had to pay $80 for my insurance, which I did have full coverage. I no longer have that. So I just feel like, if, I mean, I look like I have these illness, but I do. And I keep, I walk every day, I ride my bike every day, because I can't afford to go to the doctor. I go every month to get my chemo checked. Other than that, if I'm sick, I just have to deal with it. So I just say, if we all just come together, I believe we can win.
folks who have one shared it for I'm taking notes on what people are like sharing with me so I can bring it back. Let me just reiterate, it's not a Democratic Party event, although Americans are free to be whatever party they want. Some are Democrats, some are not. You don't have to be to be here. But I just want to say this right before I hand, yield the mic. I want to say thank you to the people who really did bring us here together today. Move on, ask me, UAW, help organize this meeting. Also, indivisible, Planned Parenthood, AFL-CIO, Mike 15. <laughs> the party, people demanding action, uh, and Progress Michigan. So thanks to Excuse all the Excuse me, who was the UAW connection? Uh, I'm a member of UAW, the, the largest local. I'm, I'm just reading off. I'm the just list. saying. I need to know who that UAW person is, and they're not, and they're not for fifteen dollars an hour. Well, okay, I'm just saying. I, I guess you. if you want to speak, just go on. Speak, mic. man. No, I'll be your voice. No, no, let's. I don't get away. Let's no, not disrespect how he said this is a health care meeting. So that's I'm, I got something else to talk about. Right, but I'm just telling you care. if we could just let the show lady have her piece. Thank you very much. Let's give her a hand, everybody. Social Security, yes, uh, our elderly people, but they're also, uh, it's also people, I'm, I'm, I'm it's, it's, it's also people who uh, uh, live on survivor benefits, yep. whose parents die, yep. but it's also people with disability on disability. And you have to go through a rigorous uh, medical uh, diagnosis before you can even qualify. Cutting these people off is going to create another uh, health care nightmare. So I just want you to understand the big package. You got the floor. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, let's let it. How are everybody doing today? Good. Uh, I'm Mark Greer with the D15 organization, Fight for Wages. Uh, the Health Care Act is essential because it, you know, it's going to it's going to put a, a a lot of 
pain and suffering on everybody because those that cannot, those that already do not have health care, you're going to suffer even more when something does go wrong because you're going to get taxed even more. Those that do have it is going to have to pay even more to sustain what you have. So if you don't have it or if you do have it, it's still going to be severe. So we got to get out and say something because it matters because if we don't, going to be in a lot of trouble. So if you got a voice, you can let it be heard. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Come on up. Come on up. Step right up. Let's give our friends a hand. It's not easy to come up here and talk in front of all you guys. So. Yeah. Well, this might be something for all, any one of you. My name is Maria Simon. I grew up in Southwest Detroit. I have been living uh, in the suburb of Gross Point Farms for the, all my married life, which is over 40 years. And I could have a lot of stories to tell you, not only about my family, uh, my children, their children, my neighbors, many. It affects everyone. Uh, but I do want to tell you that um, uh, I volunteer for WeGP. This morning we had a health task force uh, meeting. And one of the things that came up is I heard someone say they work for the auto industry. And one of the questions that came up was, okay, there's a big majority of people that feel that they're okay because their job has an insurance. <laughs> but they don't realize, just like we were fooled with the ACA and calling it Obamacare, and people were fooled, right. that the laws, even though their companies pay for their insurance or they contribute to it, they affect them too. And they, there's a large majority of people that don't know that. And um, I don't know how we can get that across because we're thinking of doing things. We also hook up with Michigan United, Michigan's People Campaign, and do things like that. But it has to start here, and we have to let people know not to be so complacent, not to feel so secure. Because with this administration, it changes in an hour. Yeah. And um, we need to focus on things like that that people don't realize. It really does affect you. Yeah, I just wanted to elaborate on what the young lady said. If you have employer-based health care, there's a lot of union folks who have negotiated their contract and accepted lower raises in exchange for stronger health care package. So it all comes out. Don't think that you're just in the clear because you have employer-based health care. That, yeah, that, that's that's a, that's definitely a point. And don't think you're in the clear just because you're a senior, because you have uh, Medicaid, no, Medicare. Right. Uh, if you're a senior and you have Medicare, uh, if you get if, if the Affordable Care Act is repealed, um, the uh, the effort to close the donut hole will also right. be repealed. So one of the things that the Affordable Care Act did is put money into the donut hole for those of you who does not who knows what the donut hole is. Those who don't know what it is, uh, which I think is a few folks, if you are a senior and you're getting and you're paying for prescription drugs, you got to pay up to about twenty-five hundred dollars. No, they'll cover up to about twenty-five hundred dollars, and then after that, you're on your own to you hit five thousand, and that's called the donut hole. So what the Affordable Care Act did is put money into that so that you could seniors would have a better. Uh, prescription drug benefit wouldn't have to pay so much money. I can't tell you, I've met many seniors who had to cut pills in half, skip a day, all kinds of serious problems. Uh, and then uh, you had seniors who took their medicine but then didn't have food. And I literally had a woman sit in my office and tell me, uh, she said, look, I was really, uh, uh, I, I wasn't taking my medicine. Why not? Because I, uh, you know, because it hurt my stomach. Why did it hurt your stomach? Well, they said I was supposed to eat uh, and take the medicine, but I didn't have any food, so I didn't take the medicine. Definitely. Think about that. Just think about that. As the Trump budget is proposing cutting energy assistance and a bunch of other things. So we got more folks who want to share, so please step right up. Let's give them a hand. Personal story. Um, 
So my father had a pre-existing condition. He had a rheumatic fever as a baby and it damaged his heart. And he was self-employed and he couldn't get insurance. Um, he ended up dying at the age of 49, uh, leaving my mother and five, five kids. Um, and then the hospital bill sent her, she, he did go to the hospital with no insurance. The bill was really high. My mother could not pay it, tried to pay it. And we ended up, you know, both losing, uh, both losing my father and, you know, losing our, uh, any kind of economic stability. So we want um, Social Security, uh, survivor's benefits, um, which is very disturbing to hear about that being cut, because that was a lifeline. Um, and interestingly, like, I remember um, when I was 18, I had a choice. I could go to college and still get Social Security benefits, um, or not go to college and not get them. And that's one, because at that point, that's how they, uh, at 18, you can still get them for another four years if you were in school. So I was like, I'm going to go to school, you know? And it was a great thing. Um, and sometime, I'm pretty sure in the 80s, that was cut. And yeah, and I was in school in the 80s, so I'm older, and I saw, like, I could see, like, the class composition of the colleges changing, like, more only wealthier people could go, and I think it affected everything, not just, like, the ability of people to get a better job, but also, like, some of the like, dumb stuff being said in schools, <laughs> because it's all elite people, and they're talking to each other, and there's some problems there, so, you know, stuff really matters at all levels, you know, um, and we did not have to go through the white path that we went through. That was so unnecessary and so painful and, that, and went on for years. Um, so that's that side of it. Um, the other side of it, I want to know, I missed the beginning, unfortunately, and I wanted to know um, I, what we should do. Now, you were saying, call Republicans and saying, hey, guys, don't do this. Um, I also got an email today saying, talking about a plan to um, add amendments to push our Democratic senators to add amendments if they have to testify to slow this thing down, like 400 amendments, 4,000 amendments. I wanted to hear if you, if you all think that's a good idea. Uh, are you down with that? Should we be doing that? Or what do we do? Because, you know, families should not have to go through this. Uh, you shouldn't have to watch people get sick and die for nothing and then be wiped out on top of it. It's just, it's, it's completely unacceptable. Okay. So, so You know, what, what the said, uh, Democrats and even some Republicans are not going to be in favor of what they're going to produce. And I think they put it, would probably have already produced it if they had a majority. The problem is, is that if they don't pass something similar to what the House did, they're going to be in a situation where um, they, they, uh, the bill will be too benevolent, as bad as it is. For the house, so they're they're having a little bit of difficulty, but uh, maybe an amendment strategy is the right thing. I know this: we have to raise our voices. The First Amendment says we can, and we should, and we should say that. Look, you know, uh, people have have a right uh, to to go to the doctor and get care. Now, is there anybody here with us right now who's never been sick and has always been healthy? It's okay. Raise your hand if you've always been healthy. Put your hand up. Okay, I got one guy. Now let me just tell you this, too. Now, young man in the green, just, young man in the green, you can, can you see my knee? Can you see my knee? You see the zipper on it? Now let me tell you, let me tell you this. I had, had, had never really broken anything. I'd never really been too sick at all. I've been really, really healthy. I done went to the gym. Young man in the green, I'm talking to you. I went to the gym. Now, you, you look like a guy who goes to the gym sometimes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And so I jumped up trying to grab a chinning bar, which is about 18 inches up over my head. And then my one hand caught it, the other hand missed it. And I fell, and I tore my patellar tendon. And I tried to get up, and I fell right back down. Now, this proves one thing. Exercise is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, but the point is, a lot of you guys in the 15 movement are, are you know you're strong, you're young, right? Am I right about that? You feel like oh I'm going to go do run some ball, I'm going to go do this and do that. You never know when you're going to turn your ankle, mess up your your uh, your Achilles. I mean it does. It's not just a matter of you know uh, older folks who need to go to the doctor. A lot of times young people need this very self-same thing. 
And how many people, young people, know somebody who got leukemia, got, you know, asthma? How many? I know a lot of young people got asthma. Right. And sometimes that asthma can get really bad. You can die from asthma. You know? So this is something that we all have to have. It's very important, yes. and you never know when you're going to need it. So look, is there anybody else who wants to come up and share their story? Yeah, please come on up. Let's give me in, everybody. My name is Don Holbrook, and I'm a retiree. I'm a community activist. And I can't say I've never been sick or ill or anything like that, but I've never had any major complications, any major issues. I am now 68. Last year, I had a serious, serious event in my life. All of a sudden, I'm in my apartment, and things just stopped. I blanked out, like, for a second or two. I was doing something that just it's like the electricity, like somebody pulled the plug. I had never been to hospital for anything. You know, never had, I just, I have a little hypertension, but that's runs in the black community, I think. But anyway, I'm saying, I'm a veteran, so I'm covered. But I think what is needed, some of the people who have these uh, employer-based uh, health care and all that, and they think they're in the clear fine. Those of us that are veterans, we say, well, we don't need, we're not concerned. We all have to be concerned about one another because yes. anything can happen at any given time. I sometimes think in terms of, all right, try to keep yourself healthy, do the right thing, do what you know is going to keep you healthy, and you won't have that to worry about. But that's not true. Anything can happen at any given moment. These bodies, are, we all come with an expiration date. That's right. So don't think because you're healthy and you're strong that it's just going to last and it's going to be all right. There's, there's crap coming out of the air, out of the water, out of everywhere that can cause you a great deal of harm. And if we don't have, in this country, the richest country in the world, we don't have that kind of health care that will cover all of us regardless of what your status is yep. in society. And we all have to fight for one another. That's okay, right. so make that your mission. We're going to fight for everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Michigan, if y'all are. Oh, my God. Right. 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 Um, I 
I'm gonna tell y'all a little testimony about me and what I'm going through right now, as of today, since I was 12. I'm struggling with a disease called vasculitis fibrosis. If people don't know what that is, it's called it's a kidney disease. Um, last time I went to the doctor, the doctor told me um, either it's gonna be either a transplant or I'm gonna be on dialysis the rest of my life. But little old me only work at McDonald's, you know, and I still got my brothers and sisters to take care of. I still got bills to take up care of. So. Me trying to penny pinch here and there, here and there, here and there, just for some health care insurance, it's not going to be enough for me. And you already, everybody knows what uh, Flint's going through with our water crisis. That's just another thing tagging on with us, you know. So, uh, what us, our lead, have, you know, our water having lead, just think about how we're going to get out of water from here, A point A to point B, it's just a lot going on. So, um, all right. Well, so my name is Scott Urbanowski. I lead one of the largest and most uh, respected elements of the Michigan Democratic Party, which is the Justice Caucus. Uh, but apart from that, I'd like to speak on a personal note. Uh, I have benefited from the Affordable Care Act in two direct ways that I know of. Uh, one is that, you know, I graduated from college in 2010, which that was the right in the midst of the recession. And everything was all, it was so difficult to get a job, especially a job with health insurance. I had to make it on part-time work. I was bartending, which is totally out of my, uh, out of what I do. Um, so luckily at the time, I was able to stay on my parents' insurance because, you know, the Affordable Care Act, lets you stay on your parents' insurance through the age of 26. Uh, and luckily for me, I got a job, ju a full-time job with insurance, just in time for my 26th birthday. Uh, but the other way in which I have benefited from the Affordable Care Act is that after I left that job, I started my own company. I have a digital media company that I started a couple years ago, and I was able to get an affordable plan through the health insurance marketplace, like millions of other people across this country and hundreds of thousands of people across Michigan. So I have been able to benefit from that. Now, I haven't had to use it, unfortunately, but I know that it's there because I know that I'm not invincible and I, I fear for the day when, I'm, uh, when I hurt my knee. And so uh, hopefully I'll, I'll remember, try to remember not to do it. <laughs> um, but I actually have a, also a question for anyone uh, who would be interested in answering. Um, obviously here in Michigan we are very blessed to have two fine United States Senators, Debbie Stabenow and Gary Peters. Uh, however, some of my relatives aren't so fortunate. I have a, um, I have a couple of relatives in the Denver area. and. They have Senator Michael Bennett, who I know does a great job, but they also have Cory Gardner, who is a Republican, and he's kind of conservative. My question to those who would be able to answer it is, how can I get them engaged in the process of getting, trying to persuade Senator Gardner or other senators, as it would be, to oppose whatever comes out of the Senate? Okay. Well, let me just say this. Uh, who might vote with us. Uh, there are some. Uh, Senator Snow, Senator Gardner, he's in a very close state. He has to, he can't think about, he's not in a deep red state where he can just go vote uh, to repeal uh, health care. So, so this is more, this is why it's very important that people are really raise their voices. That's part of what we're doing here today, is to share information with you, to hear your story, but also to say, now is the time to raise your voice. And let me also say, a lot of times people will write members of Congress letters when they're mad about something. But it's also quite legal to send a letter when you're happy about something. <laughs> if you think that, if you're glad that your congressperson or senator is standing up for health care, then you should send them a note. Because what they will do is they will say, my constituents want me to do this. And then you can tell, you can tell your own story. Okay. Like the story you told about, you know, you know, about being a 26-year-old and you, you got to stand because of the Affordable Care Act, you can stay on your parents' insurance until you're 26, 
and then you just got one in the nick of time. You should tell that story. The young man who's dealing with the uh, kidney issue, tell that story. Because you need to help your representatives understand who you are, right? And that's why we have meetings like this. So call the, uh, there's a guy in Nevada named Dean Heller. Dean Heller is in a very, very close state. Uh, they have Republicans and Democrats. It goes back and forth. Dean Heller's a Republican. He should know that if he votes to take, your, take health care away, he's going to be hurting Nevada and all Americans. So uh, if you know somebody in Nevada, you know somebody in Colorado, you know somebody in these other states, tell them to lift up their voice and stand up for health care. My name is Maxwell Woods. I'm with the Fight for D15. Now, I heard all of your, you guys' testimonies, and I come to the conclusion, like, uh, I'm hard working uh, paying uh, taxpayer citizens like everybody else in here, right? Mm -hmm. So why are we paying money for the people that's, you know, writing these bills and not give it back to the people that's, you know, we paying for it, you know? So, like, I think that, <laughs> that we're paying for something that's not benefiting us as a people. You know, we are the people. The government should be helping us. Why are we helping the people that's rich and already got it, but well, we don't even have it, you know what I'm saying? So, we gotta, like you said, we gotta stand up, have a voice, you know? Yes.